Hello, friends, and welcome to episode number 37 of Nostalgia Talk. I'm James, even though I don't sound like it, my apologies. Uh, I have a bit of a, a cold uh, this weekend, uh, so if I sound kind of funny, that's probably why. I don't have coronavirus. I promise you I don't have cor- coronavirus. <laughs> I got tested, and it came back negative, so just a cold slash sore throat. My sister had it first, and then I ended up getting it, and I deci- and she got a negative test. So I decided to get a test and it came back negative. So I uh, I don't have coronavirus. I'm fine. This will just pass. But it's still me and I'm still here. Uh, before I introduce today's guest, I would like to give a few birthday shout outs. Big surprise, right? Like always. Um, starting with the first ever guest who came on Nostalgia Talk a year ago. Oh my God, it feels so weird saying a year ago. Uh, Mike oh. Peterson. Mike is a fellow Canadian, a puppeteer who worked on Fraggle Rock, Labyrinth, Tupi and Binu, The Mighty Jungle, and a bunch of other shows. And he's a great mentor of mine and was kind enough to be the first guest to come on Nostalgia Talk. So happy birthday to Mike and also to television writer Ed Valentine. Ed was a guest on the show a few months ago and wrote for Sesame Street, Fairly Odd Parents, Ultimate Spider Man, and Marvel's Avengers Assemble. So to Ed as well, happy belated birthday. And now, without any further ado, please welcome Phil Proctor. Well, that was quite a bit of a do as far as I'm concerned, but I'm happy to I'm happy to finally be here. And my birthday was July 28th. Yes. Uh, I'm a Leo. My wife, Melinda Peterson. OK, that, that name struck a familiar chord with me. Her birthday was August 20th. So we're all in that that Leo range. In fact, all of my ex-wives have had two other wives who were Leo's. And all, most of my girlfriends were Leos. I was always looking for a beautiful version of myself that I could oh, spend wow. my life with. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So anyway, it's good to see you. you look great. Thank you. Yeah, even though I don't sound it. Uh- <laughs> well, you see, I don't know what you sound like anyway. And, and as I've gotten older, I've gotten more phlegmy. Ah, so you have to excuse me if I clear my throat a little more than, than usual. That's, and, that's anyway, all. You, you, said, you said you sound funny. Well, that's what I hope to do for most of my career. Right? <laughs> all right. So what can I do you for? Well, first of all, uh, let, let me just uh, tell our listeners what it was that, uh, that you, what it is that you're famous for. Phil was a member of the Fire Sign Theater and has had a career in acting and voiceover. He was in, oh, and he's showing me his Fire Sign Theater album. That's right. So wow. you can see uh, I'm a Leo. There's two Sagittarians and an Aries, unfortunately. And <sighs> this, this, this album cover, uh, Don't Crush That Dwarf, Hand Me the Pliers, which was uh, really a, uh, a send up of television. Uh, and it was our, our first really, really successful album after Nick Danger, Third Eye, which was a, a detective parody. Uh, we pioneered the long form comedy album. And uh, this was nominated for a Grammy, as well Ooh. as two other albums that we did. And, uh, and Dwarf actually was um, uh, in, inducted into the uh, Library of Congress historical recordings. Congratulations. They, yeah, thank you. And then even more congratulations because they bought our archives for six figures a couple of years ago. Wow. So we're, we're well represented as, as cultural icons who had an influence on the direction of American comedy and the social consciousness. So I'm proud of that. Mm. And a big influence on another past guest of mine, a fellow by the name of Alan Troutman, who said that um, he was inspired by Firesign Theater. Yeah, many people were, uh, you know, we were primarily uh, an underground group because what we were doing was kind of revolutionary and uh, evolutionary and uh, anti-establishment uh, in, in certain ways. And we, we were kind of the, the Monty Python of America, but we couldn't, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't put us on television, see? And uh, we were known as the, the jesters of the rock generation and the Beatles of comedy, which is absolutely apt because we were greatly inspired by the Beatles and their long form theme albums like Dr. Pepper. And because we had been doing that previous to it, our first album, Waiting for the Electrician or Someone Like Him, <clears throat> had three short, short pieces on the first side. And then the, the, the other side was an entire story, comic story and adventure with music and sound effects <clears throat> and, and lots of characters. 
And it was in that album, Waiting for the Electrician or Someone Like Him, that we introduced a television program called Beat the Reaper, in which one of our characters <clears throat> was inoculated with a mystery disease. And he had 30 seconds to describe what the disease was and name it uh, so that the, our topless nurse, Judy, could come in and give him the antidote. And ironically, that skit ended with him getting the plague. Oh. Okay, so the so the record ends everything. That we, listen, we're great futurists. <clears throat> Almost every album we did <clears throat> and many of our radio shows predicted the now. And it's, it's still happening in so many ways. Uh, which one of the reasons that I dedicated uh, almost 50 years of my life to doing the Fireside Theater, even though I had a career on Broadway and in movies and television, it just seemed to me to be the, the right place to be in the tumultuous uh, 70s. And obviously it was because I had a long and, and fruitful career. Mm. And in addition to the Fire Sign Theater, uh, Phil is also known for his roles in voiceover as Howard DeVille in Rugrats. He was on Toy Story, that, and there's a drawing of Howard DeVille right there. Um, he was also <laughs> in Toy Story, A Bug's Life, uh, Monsters Incorporated, Finding Nemo, The Lion King. Um, Finding Nemo. He's showing yes. you a picture there of Bob the yes. Seahorse. <laughs> Yeah. Um, is there any, is there any other uh, project that I'm, that I'm missing from the intro? Well, I've also done a bunch of, of video games uh, mm -hmm. and I was Dr. Vidic in, uh, uh, Assassin's Creed for many, many, many years for, for oh. many of the episodes. And I still do a lot of voices for, uh, uh, for those, for games and have done many over the years, <clears throat> but, oh yeah. And the other thing that I've done, that's a lot of fun is I am the drunken French monkey in the Dr. Doolittle movies. <laughs> I am a social drinker. So the, the fact that, that I was able to uh, transform the Firesign Theater career in which we did a myriad of voices into a more popular commercial career was really a great benefit to me. And I've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of voices for movies and television, cartoons, feature films, uh, cartoon features. <clears throat> and if you go to the IMBD or I am something uh, site. IMDB, yep. Yeah, you'll see a list of all of these insane things that I've done and, and met, some of whom I can't even remember. You know, well, but, I, I, I used your IMDb uh, as research for this when I was putting together the question list. So cool. Cool. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully I don't miss out on too much. Oh, listen, it's impossible. I've had my career started when I was like nine years old on live television. So I've been doing this for like, you know, 65 years. I'm 81 years old now, uh, still doing it. And uh, uh, it's 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 staggering whenever I have an interview. Uh, at the end of the interview, no matter how long it is and how much we get into, I'll wake up the next morning and go, well, I didn't talk about that. And I didn't mention, and I, and it, so, so I'm going to start off by saying, if you're interested in the fire sign theater, you can go to firesigntheater.com. Link in the description. Firesigntheater.com, where you'll have access to many of our books, including this one, which is one of my favorites, the Duke of Madness Motors, which has an MP3 in it that contains 81 hours of our radio shows. Because this, this book is all about uh, our, our radio work and how the Firesign Theater actually began on a listener supported radio in Los Angeles and then went on to a commercial station on KRLA. And uh, that was where we had a chance to work out a lot of our material for our, our records. So it was a, a wonderful kind of a, a meshed career you know, to be able to try stuff out, which we also did on stage at a place called the Magic Mushroom so that we could get an audience reaction <clears throat> find out what worked, what didn't work in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the premise of some show we wanted to make into an album. So it was a lot of fun. Nice. Um, that act, uh, what you were saying about uh, wanting to uh, start uh, uh, acting at uh, nine, that actually does go into my first question, which is uh, what inspired you to want to get into acting? Well, a couple of things. I, I, was, I was born with an innate ability to hear and repeat music and, and voices. As a baby, 
I, I hung back a hymn. My, my grandfather was singing to me in Goshen, Indiana, and he brought me downstairs and I performed for my relatives. I hummed the hymn for my relatives. I was still a babe in arms. And uh, that was the last time I ever worked for free. Just to <laughs> tell you that. So <clears throat> I had inherited this, I firmly believe, from my Amish, the Amish side of my family, the Yoders, uh, and my great uncle, Joseph W. Yoder, who wrote books about our family, Rosanna of the Amish and Rosanna's Boys. Uh, my family is quite famous among the Mennonite and the Amish community because it's, it was the story of an Irish girl, Rosanna McGonagall, O'Connor McGonagall, who was, uh, 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 was orphaned as a child and raised by the Amish in Pennsylvania. And she elected to stay with the Amish community. And she married Chris Yoder. And they had five boys, all of whom went on to do extraordinary things. One of them built towns. The other one started what we know as the cafeteria system in schools, in a Mennonite school in, in Goshen. <clears throat> and another one became built a, a milk condensing plant in Goshen that my grandfather, George Yoder, actually worked with worked in as a laborer, even though he had controlling stock in the company, right? And Whoa. it's still there. It's still there making condensed milk and, uh, and other milk products. So uh, I knew from the beginning that I, I had a talent and I was raised in a family that was full of singing and joke telling and uh, acting. Both my mother and my father were good actors uh, in school and both could have had careers in movies because they were both very beautiful people. <clears throat> but my, uh, uh, my mother in, in particular, uh, she was dissuaded from doing it because at that time people looked down on the acting profession. This is like in the twenties or whatever. But my, uh, my family, they all knew how to harmonize and they all sang all the time. And I had that ability as well. So I would, I was raised in an environment of music and, and uh, joyfulness and funny stories. So that guy, you know, I said that that was life, you know, that of course, this is what I'm going to do. <clears throat> On the other hand, having had relatives in the business, everybody said, well, you got to have something to fall back on. Can't just be an actor. And so I studied Russian. I, I'm a linguist. So the same, it's the same thing. I can hear languages and repeat them. Je peux parler français, par exemple. Pour les Canadiens là, qui comprennent le français. Yo peux parler espagnol. Il y a un autre qui est en Russie. Je peux parler deux langues. Il n'y a pas de russe qui est en Russie. Parce que je suis très bon à ces langues. Oui, je peux parler sans un accent. Ce qui est pourquoi j'ai eu une carrière de succès doing uh, looping and dubbing in movies because we had to do different languages and different dialects. And so, you know, we go from England to Brooklyn, you know what I mean? Uh, and on, on the on the way, <clears throat> maybe we'd stop in Scotland. So, you know, you had to know all these dialects and things. And of course, I spent a lot of time in Ireland because I am Irish after all. So oh, anyway, cool. <clears throat> anyway, great fun, always fun. And, uh, and I, I learned to uh, follow my instincts and pursue my desire. I studied Russian at Yale because I wanted to have maybe interpreting to fall back on if, if I couldn't find acting gigs. And I was lucky enough in my freshman year to go to the Soviet Union. This was in 1959 with the Yale Russian chorus, 40, 40 of us. And we would sing in public squares and on street corners in Moscow, we traveled all over Moscow, Leningrad, uh, Yalta, Sochi, Sevastopol, uh, Kiev, uh, where else? Lvov, all over the place. And, uh, and so I really got to speak conversational Russian at that time because they'd ask us the same questions all over again. How old is Ella Fitzgerald? Why do you surround us with missile bases? And my favorite was always, <clears throat> Look up there in the sky. Do you see what that is? See that star up there? And I go, yeah. It's a Sputnik. That's not a star. That's Sputnik. Who did that? We did that. The Soviets did that. 
you know? No. So it was, it was amazing. After each concert, we'd be surrounded by people asking us all kinds of questions. And of course, there, the only way that they access they had to the Western world was Radio for Europe at the time. And I remember it was quite amazing how they managed to take advantage of that. <clears throat> I went to a party, uh, I was invited to a party in Moscow, and uh, they had a tape recorder, reel to reel, and they were playing Elvis Presley, not only in English, but in German, right? And in French, <laughs> right? All, they got it all off the, the Radio Free Europe connection. And I always, I knew that once we put a satellite, we put a satellite up there that could broadcast down to Russia and its satellites, the whole system would fall apart because they'd finally get to see what the West was all about. You know, the same thing, we were in Berlin on our way to the Soviet Union and there was no wall. This was 59. And so we could travel by a tram across from West Berlin to East Berlin. And West Berlin was a bustling capitalistic haven. And East Berlin still had bombed out buildings from the war. And, and the only like uh, uh, skyscrapers and building developments were uh, in the Stalinist style, these giant square buildings with uh, uh, courtyards in the, in the middle. And, and, and all of the propaganda films that you would see at that time were shot on Stalin Alley, the, the just past that would drive past these great buildings. Whereas on the other side of the street, there was, you know, a bombed out post office or something. So it was oh. amazing. And it was the same in the Soviet Union. I, I fell in love with a girl named Ala in Leningrad. And uh, she finally, for the time we were there, she finally invited me to visit her apartment building. And I remember walking into one of these great, beautiful uh, apartment facades buildings. And inside it was burned and there were like almost bullet holes in the wall. It had not been repaired since the war. They just built a new facade around the old apartment building, you see? And that was when I knew that the Soviet Union was a sham and it would fall and it did. Mm. It's funny you were talking about. Uh, first of all, that that is a very interesting story. A lot of a lot of good history in there as well. But you were talking about um, doing Brooklyn accents. It's funny because, um, as I said before, we started recording. I'm working on this kids show here in yeah. Nova Scotia, and if any of you listeners are wondering about it, I can't share anything about it yet. Uh, uh, I will say this: I am actually working on it with a past guest from Nostalgia Talk, uh, Ron Doucette, who actually invited me to join this the show. Um, I can't reveal anything too specific about the show yet. I will once I get the chance to. Um, but I actually, I'm a production assistant on it, and I actually got to voice a character not too long ago. Oh, good for you! That's with, wonderful. With, with a Brooklyn accent. With a Brooklyn accent, eh? Yeah. Wow. Well, I I read the, the script. They it was it was. It's a mix of live action and animation, and they asked uh, somebody to read lines for an animated character, and I said, sure, I'll read it. And I read the script, I looked at the producers and the directors, and I'm like, can I actually voice this character when you put it in post? I, <laughs> I, I, I think I want to do this. And so um, they said, yes, go ahead. Yeah, we're going to let you do it. So they, they mic'd me so that I could record my lines then. And our director said, okay, just say something in the mic. I'm a Judge Judy watcher, so I went in the mic and I said- <laughs> I said, um is not an answer. And they decided that that was funny and asked me to voice the character that way. Oh, congratulations. That's they don't great. keep me here because I'm gorgeous and 5'10", although I am. <laughs> no, that's great. Mm. You know, you really, you really have to, to survive in the show business, or as I like to call it, the slow business. <laughs> you really have to exploit every talent you have, uh, which is why I was able... To, to sing on Broadway and uh, uh, play the violin in a commercial and, uh, uh, and do voices. The, the first, I got an agent at Yale when I was doing a show there, which was quite wonderful. And, so, and I was living in New York at the time. And the first job I ever did in voiceover was a documentary 
about the Second World War. And I voiced a Russian character talking about the siege of Stalingrad. And they went in, you read the material, Hitler was right, and blah, 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 blah. And then I, like a half an hour later, I walked out and I signed a contract for like $350. I went, ooh, this is a good gig, you know? So, so but it wasn't really till many years later that I was able to, uh, to commercialize, to get myself a voiceover agent and really make it happen. And I had, you know, I've had a wonderful career that way. Now, if you're interested in me personally, you can go to Planet Proctor dot com link also in the description good because that is a, a blog i've been writing for 25 years and it's beautifully illustrated by a friend of mine named chris gross so it's a it's pretty well cool with, blog actually it that's is a that, cool blog, i mean that's that that's how i found you to reach out to you to uh invite you to the show oh i'm delighted to hear that yeah it's something that i i put my heart and my soul into every month because there's so much going on in the world mm. and so much of it is dark and, and scary. And so I try uh, in, in the planet to lighten things up, give people a little laugh at the same time as I'm dealing with the reality of the politics and the social upheaval that we're going through, not only here, but in the world. So it's, it, it's an interesting challenge. And by the way, if you really want to find out more about me, I wrote a book with my co-author, Brad Shriver, called Where's My Fortune Cookie? And it's available, of course, on Amazon or at blurb.com. It's profusely illustrated. Oh, yeah, it's open to this. It's open, oddly enough, it's open to a picture of me and Tuesday Weld and Jack Nicholson in a movie that I did called A Safe Place. Oh, that's cool. With Henry Jaglum. But it's got all kinds of, of, of wonderful, well, you can't really see him too well. Yeah, crazy illustrations. And it, it goes into the the various aspects of, of my career. What got me out here into to LA, for example, was I did a musical comedy uh, called The Amorous Flea in New York, based on Moliere's School for Wives. I won a Theater World Award for it, as did my co-star Imelda de Martin. And they brought it out to Los Angeles. And we played at a beautiful little theater, uh, Las Palmas Theater in Hollywood. And uh, that was really my introduction to uh, Los Angeles. And I would have stayed on, but I was called back to do another Broadway musical called The Time for Singing. And I didn't get back out again, <coughs> excuse me, until I befriended uh, an actor named Brandon DeWilda, whom I understudied a play he did. For those of you who don't know his name, uh, he, Brandon DeWilda was the little boy in the movie Shane. Shane, come back, Shane. And went on to have a, an illustrious career on stage and film. We became very good friends. We came out to LA together. Uh, we connected up with Peter Fonda, of all people, and we were hanging out together, the three of us. And uh, Peter was doing research for a movie called, at the time, Captain America, but he couldn't use that, that name. So it mm. became Easy Rider. And Easy Rider is the name of a guy who lives off of prostitutes' earnings, by the way. Okay. Oh, yeah, I see. Was, I, I've seen Easy Rider before, but I've never actually known that. I know. Uh, <laughs> it, it, Terry Southern gave Peter that he, he suggested that title for the movie. <clears throat> so anyway, it was because Peter was doing research on that film that uh, that Brandon and I ended up uh, participating in a Sunset Strip riot. They call it now. Uh, they were trying to impose a curfew. This is like 67, maybe. They tried to impose a curfew on the Sunset Strip because young people were openly smoking pot and protesting the Vietnamese War. And that got the, the gray heads and the suits upset. So the, uh, po the LA police were on one side and the sheriffs on the other side. And they tried to create a riot by pushing everybody into the middle. Oh. And at one point, uh, Brandon, Peter, and I sat down in front of a famous club uh, called Pandora's Box. <clears throat> and I sat down on an open issue of the radical newspaper, the LA Free Press, still around. And uh, I sat down on a picture of 
my classmate at Yale, Peter Bergman. And it said, Peter Bergman, KPFK newsman, interviews uh, Vietnam War veterans. And I said, oh my God, Peter, KPFK, Peter Bergman. So I, I called up uh, the next day and Peter revealed to me that he was uh, doing a show, a counterculture call-in talk show called Radio Free Oz on the listener-supported station, KPFK, uh, every night, five, six nights a week. And uh, he said, why don't you come down and we'll play together. Now, Peter and I were at Yale together. He was in the class of 61. I was in the class of 62. And he wrote the lyrics for two musicals written by Austin Pendleton that I starred in. Oh, I uh, love Austin Pendleton. He's one of my favorite yeah. actors. Oh, well, if you want me to connect you with him, I can certainly do it. He's in Cleveland right now doing a play called Broadway Bound by Neil Simon. But we've, be, we've remained very close friends over the decades. And uh, he wrote uh, a musical version of Tom Jones, which I played the, the, the uh, title role in. And then another piece about uh, the Booth family, Junius Brutus Booth, Edwin Booth, and of course, John Wilkes Booth, another musical that I played uh, Edwin Booth in. And uh, Peter wrote the lyrics for those musicals. So all of a sudden, I'm reconnecting with Bergman. Uh, he invited me down to the show. I go in and I meet these two other guys, uh, Phil Austin and David Osman. And uh, they both have something to do with KPFK, with the show. And we discovered that we were all fire signs. Those are the guys on the cover of, of the album. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's kind of what they look like in, in real life. See, <laughs> there we are. There's, there's <laughs> Peter and that's the other Phil over there. Anyway, so uh, we're all fire signs. So Bergman immediately started thinking and, <clears throat> and we discovered that we could improvise together really, really easily. And so uh, Peter would be the straight man and he would set us up as various characters and then we would improvise those characters and it was always funny but at, at one point we did a thing called the Oz Film Festival and we were showing excerpts from our movies on the radio and uh, one of the people uh, Jack Love was his name played by Phil Austin uh, with an English accent he was doing uh, films for the bedroom Okay, adult films, films for the bedroom. This is 65, 66. And so he wanted to play an excerpt of the film, Blondie Pays the Rent, on television. And so it started, Blondie Pays the Rent. And Bergman said, no, 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 stop. No, no, you can't. No, no, you cannot show a dirty movie on my show. I'll lose my license and you just can't do it. And the phones lit up. And the, the listeners said, how dare you censor this guy? It's the radio, for heaven's sake. Let him show his movie. And that's when we knew that we were on to something. <laughs> the, the, everybody believed us. They go. They were going for it. And so uh, he dubbed us the Oz Fire Sign Theater. And we began appearing regularly on the show. And then uh, they moved to, uh, we moved to a venue called the magic mushroom which was a club nearby and we did a live three-hour show peter did a live three-hour show with uh, david crosby and mama cass entertaining all these famous people and interviews and crazy put-ons and everything and then we all the fire sign would do a half hour a goon show type uh comic piece every week okay <clears throat> and uh there, by the way they will soon be released in a special album in about, I'm not going to promote it too much yet because it isn't there. You can't get it. But if you go to firesidetheater.com, when it's ready, it's going to be fantastic. It's it's most of all the shows that we did at the time. And they're all very funny. And several of them later became albums, full albums, like The Giant Rat of Sumatra, our Sherlock Holmes send up. So anyway, uh, we were doing these, these uh, shows and... Uh, we, we got an agent. It's a complicated history, but the Firestein Theater became famous because of Bergman. 
who was very famous with his show. And he, in fact, he was so famous that he decided to have a gathering in Elysian Park on Easter for all of his followers. And he called it a love-in. He coined the phrase love-in. And Aww. like 6,000 people showed up. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that was when we all went like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Peter's famous and we're part of this and we're going to have some fun. So when we're doing these shows, uh, a guy from Columbia Records uh, wanted to sign us to an album. He wanted to do an album about Radio Free Oz. And, and Phil and the other Phil and Peter convinced him to do a Fire Sign Theater album. Okay. And that was the first album, Waiting for the Electrician or someone like him. <clears throat> we, we hooked up somehow, I guess through Gary Usher, who was a producer who did this, with uh, Jimmy Guercio, who was a manager who uh, was managing Chicago, among other acts. Okay. So if you listen nice. to Waiting, if you listen to the, the, uh, the record, Waiting for the Electrician or someone like him, <clears throat> you'll hear live music accompanying us live compositions and that was the wrecking crew glenn campbell is playing guitar on waiting for the electrician or someone like him i mean that's that was what the that world the, was the like. glenn campbell the glenn campbell wow i mean I'm, yeah my, my my grandmother who who uh, isn't with us anymore she just passed away last year from alzheimer's disease oh, sorry yeah, it's, we're coming up on a year since that happened uh, this month. But she always, I think she liked Glenn Campbell. Every time my dad and I went to go visit, he always played Glenn Campbell and Johnny Cash for some reason. Oh, great. Both wonderful performers. Quite yeah. different, but, but wonderful. Sa same, same type of music. I feel like Johnny Cash is a little bit more up-tempo than most of Glenn Campbell's stuff. Yeah, and he's a little raw, a little more raw. Yeah. Glenn Campbell was more of a crooner in a way, you know. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. Right. But anyway, uh, that was what the music industry was like then. The record industry was just in its baby phase, was just starting. And uh, a lot of it was because of stereo, the invention, the creation of stereo, which allowed for a much more uh, fuller experience in listening to music, classical music, pop music, anything. And, and as the music industry grew we were there because we had a five-year contract with columbia and actually after our first record which you know i mean nobody knew who we were uh, who, who is this band you know nobody was doing rock and roll comedy you know and uh, and so the the suits at columbia wanted to drop us they said, who, are the, who are these guys we don't even need these guys they're crazy and a guy named john mcclure who was head of masterworks a division of Columbia Records. He stood up with our record. He said, these guys are geniuses. They've created the long form comedy record. If you don't want them, I will sign them to a spoken arts contract, which he did. And that gave us almost unlimited studio time in exchange for a, a smaller royalty. <laughs> but we could go into the studio pretty much anytime we wanted. And that liberated us because we could write material, go into the studio, try it out, and that would inform the rest of our writing and the rest of our recording. So we didn't have to go in with a full-fledged project. We could actually use the experience of recording and hearing what we were doing in order to, to uh, inform the direction and, and the... Uh, shape of the albums we were doing and that's why they're so complex and so layered okay <clears throat> and uh, uh that was a great great gift to us and the major reason for our success besides the creation of <clears throat> stereo radio okay that combination firesign theater which is with its very complex uh <clears throat> stereo recording stories movies for the mind we used to call them <clears throat> in combination with stereo radio <clears throat> pardon me which was primarily utilized by colleges at that time because they could play you know a 20 minute cut from an album without having to do any commercial interruptions all right yeah no 
Nobody could play on commercial radio a 20 minute cut, you know, and, and we didn't design them for excerpts for radio excerpts. So it was because of uh, the, the, the sudden emergence of stereo radio stations that in, in underground places that the Firesign Theater became famous enough to be able to tour the country and play, you know, Carnegie Hall, places oh, like nice. that. Yeah. <clears throat> we actually, we performed at the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium as part of a benefit for, I, I guess, KPFK, Pacific Supported Radio. And uh, Abe Lastvogel uh, was in the audience. He was, happened to be uh, a, a manager uh, of like Frank Sinatra, and uh, oh God, who knows who else? Famous, famous, famous people. And he signed us to a William Morris contract. William Morris was one of the strongest, you know, agencies in the in the world at that time. He liked what he saw, signed us up, and that's how we got all these great tours put together. So, like so many things, it was ch- kind of chance. In in my book, <laughs> where's my fortune cookie? Uh, uh, I write a lot about that, how, you know, like sitting on Peter Bergman's face led to the Firesign Theater for me. And oh, my God, you, you when you read the, the things that happened in my life and they still happen, that kind of led me uh, in, in my career. You, you will you'll be astounded. And I, I hope you'll recognize in your own life that sometimes things happen and you have to be aware of what they mean to you, because it might be a whole path. It's like meeting somebody you fall in love with at first sight, you know, but it can also be something like a job opportunity. You just got a job opportunity because you said, can I do this voiceover? Okay. So you don't know where that's going to lead. It it could lead to another aspect in your career, but it's only because you asked for it. Mm. It's only because the opportunity arose as Hamlet says in Shakespeare, the readiness is all remember that and use it as a mantra okay thank you <laughs> so let's move on a little bit from fire sign theater and talk a little bit about blah, 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 and talk a little bit about your uh animation roles because that's what i know you for of course yeah uh, and of course as i mentioned in the intro toy story toy story 2 um, Toy Story 2 actually is my very favorite animated film of all time. Oh, that's wonderful. Because I was so little when it came out. I was like nine months old, I think. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, what did you do in Toy Story 2? Uh, I don't know. You see, one of, the, one of the things that's so weird about doing adding voices, uh, see, there's two aspects to our work. One is you're cast in a role like Howard in the Rugrats. Mm -hmm. You do the role. That's the role you do. When you do uh, looping and dubbing for movies, uh, especially the Pixar movies and the Disney movies, you you go in there with a group of maybe 12 other insanely talented people. And uh, they put a character up on, on the screen. Maybe it's not even animated yet, just a drawing. And they say, okay, Phil, you and Roger Bumpus, who of course hit it. If anyone, if anyone doesn't know who Roger Bumpus is, uh, Roger's the voice of Squidward on SpongeBob. That's and right. What good timing for me to be wearing hey, this shirt. Oh my God. Oh, that's wonderful. I know that none of you listeners can see it, but I'm wearing a SpongeBob shirt that has Squidward on it. Oh, that's wonderful. So uh, anyway, uh, and we both will read for the part. We both read for it. And then they say, okay, Phil, you do it. You go, okay. And so I do the part. It, it's not necessarily a big part. It might just be a little, you know, a, a, a robot or a, uh, a cat or who knows what. And you do it and it becomes a part of history. Uh, and I've done so many of these, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these things. It's really hard for me to keep track of what I've done. Not only that, but sometimes I don't even recognize my voice because you go to different places to voice a character. You know, you see it and you, and you kind of, at least I hear it in my head, it's gonna sound like this. And I'll do that particular voice. Is that the voice that it is? Or maybe it's a voice <laughs> like this, but it's not my voice. And I remember 
that was really made uh, clear to me. Recently, I got a, uh, had an interview with a French journalist for an online c c cinema uh, magazine. Uh, and uh, we had a conversation. He called me from Paris. And what he wanted to know was, there's a series called Asterisk. Don't know if you know it, a French, French series called Asterisk. Uh, very, 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 very famous. Uh, look it up, Asterisk with an X. And it's, it's very clever. It started as like a, a graphic novel, if you will, cartoon, like Tintin, Tintin. And, uh, and, went, and they went on to make some live action movies. And I was cast as the wizard in this one called Cleopatra. And I went into, and he wanted to know what it was like in that recording session. And I had to tell him, je ne me rappelle pas. I don't remember. I don't remember doing the recording session at all. And it's a major role. And so, you know, he sent me a copy of the film uh, in uh, English, dubbed, and, and French, by the way. And I listened to my voice. I looked, heard the part of the wizard. I didn't know that was me. I had found some character that matched the look of this actor and the style of the film so perfectly that I disappeared. I disappeared. That has happened to me again. I went to see a Tarzan. I play an elephant in Tarzan. The one with the great Phil Collins soundtrack? Yeah. Yeah. Another movie I, from I, my I, childhood. Yeah. And, and I, I, we saw it at the, the cast and crew screening at the uh, El Capitan Theater in Hollywood. The big cavernous old fashioned theater. It's got a, you know, an organist like the old theater days, movie days. And, uh, and my part comes on and there's the elephant. And I hear it speak and I go, oh, well, that's not me. It's not me. They must have replaced me. And I was very kind of depressed. And the elephant came on again and did his thing. And it was okay. And so I, I went home and I, I had a DVD. In those days, children, we didn't have discs or downloads. We had DVDs. Uh, I mean, we had, we, had, we had little tapes, little tape cassettes, right? Oh, yeah. So, back, at, back in the day, as my boss would day, often say. Back in the day. So I, I put it in and I came up to my scene. It was me. It was just in that cavernous hall with all of those big speakers, whatever voice I had discovered was, you know, somehow disguised, distorted in some way, but it was me, you know? So, you know, when you ask me what voices I did, in fact, I get a fan mail from all over the world now. And so many times fans will send me pictures of characters I've done. And I'll go, where did I do that? Well, it kind of makes me wonder if you recognize this guy in my hand. Yeah, they have, that's, that's Charlie from yes. Monsters Incorporated. Yeah, oh, that's and, pretty cool. Mm -hmm. and I don't have one of those. I found this at a uh, market in Dartmouth, and I thought it was so cool that I, uh, that I picked it up. Um, but that's in the, good. But in this role, you got to do one of the most famous lines in Monsters, Inc. Which is what? 2319! We have a 2319! <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's a famous line now, huh? 2319, because the monster, for those who don't, you don't know it, had a sock. My, my monster, I was his manager. He had a sock stuck to his back. Mm -hmm. which was, you know, one dimension to another, just horrible so basically, disaster. Basically, you know, the plot of Monsters, Inc. is that it's, a su like, there's no evidence of this, but basically it's said that human children and anything they touch is toxic to monsters, but then it's revealed they're really not. And That's so right. anytime something from the human world or a human comes into the monster world, it's, it's mass panic, but as it turns yeah. out, no problem at all. Yeah, they call in the SWAT squad. The CDA. To, de de to de decontaminate it and all that. Yeah. Oh, that was so much fun, that mm. movie. I mm. mean, all, all of those Pixar films were amazing because I started with The Beauty and the Beast, which was 
actually a Disney film, but it had a computer animated segment in it. The ball, the ball was computer animated. And, uh, and then we started working with Pixar and each film that they did would advance further into the computer world. Right. And, yeah, exactly. You know, and I remember when we saw Finding Nemo and we saw all of the silt floating underwater in the water. It, it, it was just mind boggling, you know, and we, we were so happy to be working in these movies because every time we'd come in every six months or so, we knew we were going to see something startling, startlingly new, you know, which we did. It was fantastic. Mm. Were you ever called back to reprise the role of Charlie for the new Monsters at Work TV series that's on Disney no, Plus? No, no. Uh, what, what actually uh, happens in our industry, as in many other industries in this business, is that you reach a point where you're aged out. Oh. Not because you can't do it anymore, but they just don't want any gray heads in the recording session. Why does that matter? It doesn't. But, but it, what it has to do is really with passing the torch from one generation to another, which is, you know, totally understandable. Uh, the people that I worked with, Lee French, Mickey McGowan, uh, Barbara Harris, uh, they, were, they brought together groups of people who were absolutely marvelous in what they did. And it was kind of like the loop group. You know, and, and when, when I'd show up uh, at Disney to do some looping, there'd be all my friends. They were all there. And we all had worked with one another. Roger Bumpus was a part of that group at that time. And we knew what, you know, we, we knew what kind of voices we could do, what languages we could speak, what kind of fun we could have together, and what kind of improvisation we could do. And at a certain point, after, you know, I did it for 30 years or something like that, at a certain point, new younger people were taking over okay and that's the way it is now i just saw a wonderful movie called coda coda wonderful wonderful movie uh, and and the loop group at the end they had three names listed didn't recognize any of them on the other hand what was the movie i saw last night oh yeah uh wait a minute lee french Oh, anyway, I saw a movie last night that I did voices for, and the credit was for Lee French. And I went, sure, you know, Lee French. Gosh, I can't remember the name of that movie. That's terrible. I'm sure so, it'll come to mind yeah. eventually. Oh, and, and, and today, right now at four, no, at four o'clock, my time, I'm on television right now in a movie called Sunday in New York on the TCM channel, which oh, was nice. the first movie I ever did. Uh, I, I'm in a scene with Jane Fonda. It's just, I don't even have any lines. I'm just being rowed in a rowboat by a pretty girl. And we go by Jane Fonda and her boyfriend. And, and, and he says, you should row me. And then she splashes him. It's a bit uh, that we filmed in, in Central Park. <clears throat> the reason I got the part was because I have an uncle who was in the industry called Clarence Urist. And Clarence uh, let me read for this role right after I, right when I was doing the soap opera and it was my first movie role. Just again, getting my feet wet in, in, in the boat park in Central Park, you know, where later when we, the film A Safe Place directed by, written and directed by Henry Jaglum with Tuesday Weld, Orson Welles, Gwen Wells, and Jack Nicholson whew, and me, we filmed a lot of stuff in the boat park in, in Central Park. I mean, it's a lot of fun. If, if I had pursued a movie career, I know I would have had many more adventures, but in foreign countries and things, because I speak all these languages. But instead of that, I've had many adventures with my wife, Melinda Peterson, traveling, mm. traveling around. Uh, speaking of uh, working with many different uh, actors and many different legendary actors, I was wondering if uh, you had any interaction with Ed Asner, who we just lost last weekend. Funny you should ask. I co-authored a play called God Help Us that toured the United States and Nova Scotia starring oh. Ed Asner. 
Wow. And it had been touring very successfully <clears throat> for years. I co-authored it with a, a, a fellow named Sam Joseph, <clears throat> with whom I also co-authored a book about the right wing called What to Say to Your Crazy Right Wing Uncle, a handbook for liberals and a series of children's books <laughs> called, called, called uh, uh, Ted and, uh, I have to look at it, uh, Tyler and Tess and the Magic Maze. This is just coming out now. It's a trilogy. Nice. <laughs> so uh, I try to keep my hand in writing as often as I can. But this play is a political comedy. And basically the premise of it was God, played by Ed Asner brilliantly, uh, calls up two talking heads, uh, like James Carville and his wife. And uh, one is a liberal, one is a conservative, and he wants them to debate the issues of the day because God is concerned that the, the world could be torn asunder by all this divisiveness that's happening in the world right now, especially in our country. And so the two people stand at podiums and debate one another in limbo. And God sits on his golden throne behind some clouds with angels flanking him. And he interacts with them and goads them to answer certain questions. And he says he's going to put his mighty thumb on the scale in one or the other other's favor. But at the end, at the end, he offers a solution to our problems instead, which I don't want to tell you in case we can continue to tour the show with somebody like uh, Henry Winkler in the role or Jason He'd Alexander. Oh, yeah. yeah. Would do, we, we're looking for too. someone to replace Ed, but Ed is irreplaceable. irreplaceable. Oh, yeah. And, and I've had, I had the great pleasure of working with Mr. Asner over about a decade. Because one of the things that Ed liked to do was old radio or a new radio. He liked to do audio presentations in front of live audiences. And uh, I dedicated a lot of my time to doing things like that. <clears throat> and we were both very close friends of the master of the, the poet of the golden age of radio, Norman Corwin. And Norman lived to, I think, 102. He, his whole family is very long lives. I think his brother is still alive. And we got to perform his radio pieces, often directed by him, over a couple of decades in various live and recorded venues. And Ed was part of that company. So I got to, that's how I first got to know him. Mm. working with him doing radio plays basically mm. i i met him once too he was what well, i bet he hugged you he was he was he, so I, I i i tickled his funny bone i'll give you that ed ed was one of those people he was he was like a, a an ornery fuzzy bear yeah you know? how and, how i how i describe him uh, from my experience and from what i've heard from pat fraley pat fraley was a guest on this show i love pat love oh pat. yeah uh cuz him and Ed were like besties and, yeah. mm -hmm. and the way that I kind of think of Ed as is that if you make him laugh, you will leave an impression <laughs> because have you, have you ever seen up? Oh, of course. I, I'm sorry. I wasn't in it. <laughs> I was, I was unable. I was out of town at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't do it, but yes, of course. Well, when I, when I met Ed, it was at the D23 Expo, which is a Disney conference in L.A. Yep. And <laughs> I've done that. Yeah. OK, cool. Uh, yeah. And um, Pete Doctor, who directed up and Jonas Rivera, who produced it, were right there. It's my turn to go up to Ed. And I went, hi there. My name is James, like kind of imitating Doug. And he looked at me funny and he goes, get the hell to the back of the line, kid. <laughs> so I have an autograph. I handed him an up poster from the oh, sign and he just good. he still just kind of is looking at me funny and my dad was a big mary tyler moore fan and who was it yeah <laughs> you got spunk yeah i, I hate, hate spunk, spunk. <laughs> exactly <laughs> and yeah my dad's an ed asner fan and i said ed this is my dad and 
I'm thinking to myself, I am about to starstruck my father. And Ed shakes my dad's hand and is like, how do you put up with this kid? <laughs> so I got a photo with Ed. And in the photo, he's just looking at me kind of grumpy like. Yeah, I know. And he's, he looks. He's and he, a so, soft-hearted grump, you know. Really. And he said, and he says to my parents, "You're doing a good job with him." Oh, so that's man, that's man. my Ed Asner story. Now, did Fraley tell you the uh, uh, the Nazi Jewish Nazi neighborhood story? You mean where he uh, w- uh, where they vandalized some his house? some some bot, some crazy skinheads yeah. <clears throat> uh, vandalized spray painted Ed's door mm-hmm. with Nazi symbols and things, and Fraley, who lived across the street went over and w- w- removed it, cleaned his mm-hmm. door. Oh, yeah. And, and then Ed came over to thank him. And Fraley said, don't, don't, uh, don't think of it. Do you think I want people to know there's a Jew in the neighborhood? <laughs> I recently posted what I call a nostalgia talk bonus, which was a tribute to Ed. And I included oh. Pat telling that story on, on the video. Good. You have to send me a link to that. Oh, of sure. course. Yeah, for sure. Sure. I can even include it in the next Planet Proctor and oh. give your show a little plug. Cool. Awesome. Sure. Mm. That's so, what I like to do. Mm. so let's move on a little bit from Disney and talk about another voice role that you're very famous for, which is as Chuck DeVille on Rugrats. Uh, how did you get that? Uh, Howard DeVille. Oh, sorry. Chuck, Chuck I don't know DeVille. why oh. I just said Chuck. Uh, Howard well, DeVille. Because I of just... Chucky. Chucky's yeah. a little, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I used to watch Rugrats when I was a kid. Like, when I grew up, I wanted to be either a Rugrat or a Powerpuff Girl. But to be honest, it's only recently. <laughs> uh, never never have dreams, kids. I'm just saying. Never never let TV uh, influence yeah, dreams or, like or that. Erode your mind. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Uh, it's well, only... that, was, that, was, that was one of those things. Yeah. Where... But it's only just recently that I'm getting back into Rugrats. It's been a little while. Well, Rugrats, 14 years of, was Rugrats. Yeah. We did it so long that when they did this spinoff called All, All Grown Up. I remember had, All they, Grown Up, yeah. Yeah, they put uh, gray streaks in our, in our character's hair. <laughs> they, they put a gray streak in Howard's hair, okay? So he looked older. But uh, it was an audition, and I went in. Klasky Shupo, it's a studio and offices. We're in a, a little building on uh, Highland below Hollywood Boulevard next to a place called the Little Red Schoolhouse, which had a reputation as being like a very liberal school for kids. And they had uh, two stories in this building. <clears throat> well, one story was <laughs> the writers for writing them downstairs. Uh, one story was uh, this room filled with like writers and cartoonists. And the second story was a studio, a little tiny studio with another little tiny studio next to it in which Mark Mothersbaugh was writing the music for Rugrats on a synthesizer. Nice. And, and this tiny little studio, I went in, they showed me a picture of the character uh, and they described him, he's nerdy and he's this and he's that. And I said, so I did, you know, I did a kind of a nerdy guy like that. And they cast me in the part. And that meant that for the next 14 years, I would go into the, for the first, like, I think seven of those years, uh, I'd go into this tiny little studio and record my stuff, sometimes with another actor, but more often than not, just my own voice reacting imaginarily to the other actor. And then they became so successful that they bought a building, a big building on Sunset Boulevard, Mm -hmm. Basky Shupo Productions, because they were doing the wild thornberries and they were doing this thing with monsters. They were doing a lot of- I think think that's uh, Ah Real Monsters. Yes, that's right. And and so- I'm I'm a Nickelodeon kid. Good, you got it. So they were were doing all this stuff. And, uh, and, And we worked in a much- fancier schmancier studio and in in that instance that studio we could actually work with one or two other actors which made it more fun of course uh because there was there was room for for us to work together and uh and and then there were also guest stars 
you know, he came in and Nancy Cartwright took over a role of uh, uh, who's a national girl. Uh, you babies, who's a national girl? Uh, Angelica? Angelica, Angelica. Yeah. She took over the role of Angelica because the original person who had done it was in an automobile accident and she couldn't remember how to do voices after that. It had hurt that part of her brain to brain damage in the area that allowed her to do all these voices. How about that? Wow. So Nancy had been doing it. Now, there was actually a break, you may remember. No, maybe you don't. Uh, there was, we did a whole It's been a long of, time since I've seen well, Rugrats. Well, but this, so. is, this is just a professional story. Okay. Because we did, we did a lot of them. And then there was, they kind of took a break for like two years or something. I don't know. Nickelodeon just said, we're not going to do them anymore or something. But it was so popular that they had to bring it back. So we did a total of 14 years of those episodes. I still love watching them. It's such a smart show because it spoke to both the adults and the children. Mm. It's a brilliant show. Now, the other day, <clears throat> uh, I was, I got up in the morning and I got a phone call from a comic partner of mine named Jamie Alcroft, who achieved a great deal of fame. You'd actually enjoy uh, uh, interviewing him with Mac and Jamie, who, a comedy duo that traveled all over the place and uh, was on the Carson show three or four times and did, had their own te television show on CBS. And Jamie, uh, we did a thing together called Boomers on the Bench, which you can Google on Facebook, Boomers on the Bench. And uh, anyway, we became, we came pals. He still does stand up. He does voices. He does all kinds of voices. And he also has done a lot of characters in uh, War Duty, uh, in, in, in a lot of those um, interactive games, like, like I have, but big ones. He played a big sergeant or something anyway. I'll, I, I can connect him, you with him because he'd be a great interview. Anyway, Jamie calls me up and says, I just auditioned for the new Rugrats. I said, great. What did you read for? Grandpa. I said, yeah. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. You know my age. And, and he said, and then I asked my agent. <coughs> I asked my agent. I said, I, I know that like Jack Riley, who played uh, uh, the father, he, he's passed away. So could I read for that part? And he said, oh, oh no, no, no. He said, they're recasting everything. And I went, what? Because I was figuring, hey, I'll get back on, you know, Howard lives. I, can I was, go I was, to, I I was wondering, that was, that was one of the questions I had in here was if uh, you were asked to come back. No, they, they, brought, no. they brought back the voices for the kids. Yeah. Yeah. But that was only because the, the kids' agents kind of insisted on it. They said, come on, they can still do their voices. I, I haven't seen it. Uh, I don't, I, all I know is that I got a, a postcard from a fan that is, a, I should have brought down to show you. It's a picture of Howard and I'm holding a, 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 a placard and it says Howard's lives, Howard's life matters. Okay. <laughs> There's a movement among the fans to bring me back on this show. You know? Well, maybe, maybe if it gets renewed for a second season, they'll bring your character back. So again, you know, you know Nick, Nickelodeon, if you're listening, yeah, keep, listen, keep this guy listen. in mind. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. The, the thing, James, the, the real thing is it, they, they want to recast it with younger people so that they can squeeze another 14 years out of them. You see what I mean? Oh. It's, it's purely a professional decision. Uh, and, and that's true. If you think about everything that I've been going through, I'm 81 years old. I, I could have quit in, at 78 and just said, ah, it's enough. I've done enough. I just, <laughs> but, but you know, the, the sad thing about our business and the wonderful thing about our business is that we can really keep doing it as long as we can remember lines. If we're doing stage work, walk, see, hear, you know, and read lines, you know, yeah. <laughs> do voices. You can keep doing it. So, I do more occasionally now than I'd like to, but I still do it. 
another role that um, you did was uh, Electro in the animated Spider-Man series. It's funny. I was earlier talking about Ed Valentine, who wrote for Ultimate Spider-Man. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. And you were in Spider-Man, the animated series. Not For any of the listeners who are confused, it's not the same show that Ed wrote for. But no. um, <laughs> uh, I, I've done, I did a couple of those uh, superhero uh, uh, shows. Okay. And, uh, uh, and, and they're great fun to do because again, you can do very exaggerated characters and in the, the Batman game, was it? I played, I, I did two, I, I did two characters in two Batman games, uh, villains, generally bad guys. But I mean, again, it's, I have to look at a list of things that I've done and, and say, yes, I did this and this and this and this, and this. because and, and I'm not the only guy who would say this. Anybody who uh, has been as active in voiceover as I have has the same problem because you, you really go from one job to another. In the old radio days, <clears throat> there's these famous stories about uh, Orson Welles, who, as I say, I had the great pleasure to work with in this film, A Safe Place. And Orson Welles was so famous and did so many roles on radio shows that he would have one radio show he had to do at NBC, another over there at CBS, another one over there at ABC. And so he would go from one gig to another in an ambulance. Orson, or, Orson Welles? Yep, yeah, they, Pat Fraley they, was mentioning that. Yeah, they'd ride him in an ambulance from one gig to the other. So because it was live then, mm -hmm. it was all live, you know. Actually, when I did my soap opera, uh, time, uh, Edge of Night, it was live. We did it live uh, with, uh, thank God, with teleprompters. And I remember, uh, and then we went to tape, okay? With, I think one of the first shows that went to tape. And that gave me an opportunity to watch my performance. And I remember thinking, because I was, I was new to the whole world of, of soap operas and, and the way that you do them and everything. And uh, occasionally, because you had to learn a new show like every day, I would have a little insecurity with my line and I could look over at the teleprompter and pick it up and go right ahead. And I thought, well, I wonder if anybody can see me doing that little look over the teleprompter. And so when it was taped, I could watch myself. Couldn't see it. Couldn't see it. And it gave me even more confidence. I could read the whole damn thing off the teleprompter like this and nobody would know it. <laughs> That's you know? Well, I, at, le at, at least at least you're fooling people. That's yeah. Well, it, it, the whole point is entertaining people, keeping them in the show. Yeah, because because yeah, because if they know because yeah, because if they don't notice that you're reading a teleprompter, then you're doing your job well. Yeah, yeah. So let's wrap it up with a fan question. This question comes from a listener of Nostalgia Talk. Um, okay. His name is Robert Wallace, and he wants to know what is your favorite episode of Rugrats. Oh boy, th those are tough questions. Um, the, there's one, the big, what was it called? The big house? There's one in which I played uh, not only Howard, but a couple of criminal characters as well. Uh, but these questions, right? what is your favorite? Very, very hard question. Yeah, you know, I, I get know, asked that a lot about guests. Like, I get a lot of who's been your favorite interview, and I'm like, well, they're they're people with yeah, lives, you know. Yeah, yeah it, it, for for, uh, and especially for, because I'm still close with so many of them. So for for Mr. Wallace, I can say a true answer would be every one of them, you know, because the the joy of being able to do a series is that you get your you 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 can your character gets to evolve. You get to investigate different aspects of your character because the writers will, you know, focus on you in different ways, put you in different situations. And that allows you to either be very flustered or to, you know, to, sh to show up with a little strength, you know, I mean, choices that the actor can make and sometimes the director, you know, but the joy of it is being able to do a continuation to do a series of those things. I had lots of favorites, you know, I'd, I'd come home from one recording session and say, gosh, that was fun. 
mm. today. I, I never came back from any recording sessions and said, oh man, that was a bummer. <laughs> it was always fun, but some were more fun than others. And sometimes it had to do with the people you're working with. Melanie Chartoff, for example, if I had any scenes with her doing another character voice. Jack Riley was a great, great, great friend of mine, you know, and, uh, uh, and the directors that we worked with, it was a good family. It was a very, very good family and fun, fun to work together. Well, Robert, I hope that that answers your question. Um, <coughs> pardon me, still have, have the cold. Hey, um, I understand. <laughs> Gesundheit. Um, Phil, thank you very much for coming to Nostalgia Talk uh, tonight. Is there anything you'd like to say to wrap up? I know, except that I will wake up tomorrow morning thinking of all the things I didn't talk about. <laughs> and I'm sure I'll, and sh I'm sure after this is posted, I'll be thinking, oh crap, we didn't bring that up. But you know, no, I, that's fine. But I, I'd, I'll, I'd, I'll, I'll probably just email you with questions that I've got. That yes, that's fine. Here. And I, I'd love to know the responses to it, to the show. And, uh, and a yes, indeed. If you go to planetproctor.com, uh, you can sign on as a planeteer and anybody can reach me personally at phil.proctor at mac.com if you have any other questions or you want autographs or anything like that. I'd, I'd be happy. I love sending autographs to Buenos Aires and Moscow and, and, and Newfoundland. <laughs> not that far away from here. No, no. It isn't. I was no. just there not too long ago. There you go. And, yeah, I, all, and I made a little documentary about it too. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, I want to stay in touch with the stuff that you're doing. So by all means, Send me links to things, and I'll promote it when I can, okay? Awesome. And to all you regular listeners out there, see you next time on Nostalgia Talk. Peace. Great pleasure. Bye.